Thank you. Um, just let me share the screen once more. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for saying how much you're looking forward to this. Um, I can't help but feel that uh, I'm going to disappoint somebody. I've never had so many people tell me they've been looking forward to me speaking before. Um, but I hope uh, that the disappointment isn't too great. So, uh, as has been said, um, uh, the topic for today is Russia's populist uh, discourse, its invasion of Ukraine and challenges for the EU. Um, I'm going to sort of concentrate really on the first parts of this, that is Russia's populist discourse uh, and saying some things about how um, uh, they informed the decision um, to invade Ukraine in February of this year. Um, I'll say a few things about challenges for the EU, but um, I'm not. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Russian politics specialist, uh, far more than I'm a, an EU specialist. Um, so uh, I think you know, sort of, uh, it's probable that you'll have as many ideas about how these things might be problematic for for the EU and for the West generally, actually, not just the EU. Um, uh, so um, I'll, I'll say a few things about that, but we might um, uh, discuss that more um, uh, subsequent uh, to the the lecture. So uh, what I'm going to do is, is talk about, you know, sort of uh, where populism comes from uh, in, in Russia, because it's, it's unusual. Mostly when we think about populism, we think about populist movements and populist movements accessing power, whereas uh, in Russia, things are a little bit more sort of topsy-turvy. Uh, you have the development of a populist discourse, um, uh, in particular uh, in 2011, 2012, and afterwards, um, uh, from a regime which is already in power. So uh, populism um, doesn't come, if you like, uh, from below. It doesn't come from uh, a, a, a movement that, you know, sort of creates uh, a, a populist discourse, sees a leader emerge um, through the articulation of that discourse and the development of a movement uh, and then sort of seeks power. Um, it develops from within power. Um, uh, and that's something slightly different. Uh, I'll say something uh, more about the substantive nature of the discourse uh, and how it created certain ideas about foreign policy, ideas which um, challenge uh, some of the sort of um, principles uh, that uh, democratic states certainly used uh, uh, to uh, orientate themselves in the world, uh, but uh, which, you know, sort of uh, seeks to upset the whole um, uh, balance of, 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 of state politics in general uh, globally uh, and how that, you know, sort of has informed the war and, you know, sort of obviously some of the challenges that exist before us uh, are practical uh, over the next uh, little while, but some are uh, with dealing with this vision of the world. Um, and it's possibly not only um, uh, a problem in dealing with Russia, but possibly also a problem dealing with a lot of other countries, um, China, India, uh, Turkey as well. Um, so uh, uh, those are questions that we can discuss. So, I don't know why my computer's not working. There we go. So, um, where does populism come from? Well, uh, some people have identified elements of populism uh, in uh, Putin's Russia uh, from very early on uh, in his first administrations, uh, uh, you know, sort of his first two terms as president um, uh, in uh, 2000, 2004, 2004 to 2008. Certain ideas were put forward during this period of time. People talked, for example, about uh, Russia as a sovereign democracy. And this idea of a sovereign democracy uh, said that, um, you know, sort of uh, Russian democracy was culturally distinct uh, from liberal democracy in that it didn't place such great value on pluralism. Uh, it uh, was more concerned with uh, the unity of the state uh, uh, and protecting uh, the sovereignty of the state uh, than it was with uh, the representation of sectional interests. Uh, and this, you know, sort of was identified by some people as a uh, populist theme uh, that was going to, you know, sort of um, uh, 
uh, sweep Russia towards uh, uh, populism. The other sort of uh, main theme that was uh, seen as, as being uh, populist in its nature uh, was the idea of Russia as a great power. And the idea of Russia as a great power was, you know, something that was talked about again during the 2000s. Uh, and it was seen by some people as being um, a, uh, a, 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 a uh, a rhetorical um, a trope, a device, uh, a, a signifier, whatever you want to call it, uh, that bound together um, uh, uh, the Russian people, no matter what their um, social economic interest was, uh, no matter what their uh, views on uh, economic redistribution or political power, uh, and therefore it was, if you like, a sort of organizing concept that underpinned populism. Now, it's true that these things were sort of talked about um, uh, in uh, the, 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 the 2000s, um, you know, sort of uh, was a lot of, you know, sort of attention paid, for example, to the, uh, the notion of sovereign democracy and to the uh, advisor to Putin, uh, Vladislav Surkov, who uh, was the person who talked about sovereign democracy and put forward a theory of sovereign democracy. Uh, but it's a little bit too much to say that these were, you know, sort of um, uh, really um, cementing uh, Russia within the populist camp uh, for lots of different reasons. The first is, is that, you know, sort of um, these were not themes which were necessarily picked up um, and certainly not picked up directly uh, by Putin himself. Um, so he did not, for example, ever uh, talk about Russia as a sovereign democracy. Um, in fact, you know, sort of he equivocated on that issue. And at the time that, you know, sort of the notion of sovereign democracy was being put forward, um, Putin uh, made speeches in which he directly linked uh, the name. Russia's democracy to the nature of democracy in Europe more generally. Uh, and, you know, sort of uh, contra to uh, the sort of uh, the nativist vision of democracy that was put forward by people like Surkov, uh, Putin, you know, sort of explicitly said that Russian democracy was a form of European democracy, that Russia's political and historical development had been in lockstep with Europe's and that, um, you know, things that had developed in Europe, uh, like notions of rights, like notions of parliamentary democracy uh, had always had their mirrors in some way in Russia, um, always uh, uh, an accurate reflection, but mirrors of some sort, uh, and had influenced Russia. And so Russia's development as a democratic political system was not uh, in isolation or different to uh, that of uh, liberal democratic, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 liberal democracy. So, you know, sort of, there were sort of certain constraints on populism's development, not least uh, the fact that, you know, sort of Putin uh, himself was not committed to uh, uh, this populist vision or some of these populist concepts. Um, Putin did talk more about, you know, sort of Russia uh, as a, a, a power within the world, uh, but still what he was talking about was uh, Russia as a power in partnership. There were problems with this partnership uh, with other countries uh, because uh, of uh, the foreign policies of other countries, particularly the foreign policy of the United States, uh, which was not acting in concert with other states and other powers, but was, in fact, uh, for Putin, a revisionist power uh, that was you know, sort of going its own way and that that was the problem. So it wasn't uh, that, you know, sort of Russia's great power status uh, was in any way unique or connected to some characteristic uh, of uh, Russianness uh, that, you know, sort of could uh, uh, serve as the basis of a sort of populist foreign policy uh, in Putin's articulation of these things, it was, you know, sort of that, you know, sort of there was not um, a, a proper uh, sort of partnership between international political actors uh, uh, because of the faults of the United States. And it was the United States and neoconservatism uh, that were the problem. Uh, not, you know, some sort of fundamental um, uh, 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 disabling uh, of Russia uh, because uh, its, 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 its essential nature and characteristics were being denied by other countries. Uh, 
So there were constraints upon the development of populism during this uh, sort of first period. Uh, and those constraints were um, heightened after uh, 2008 when Putin was prime minister uh, and you sort of got a far more technocratic approach to uh, politics uh, come uh, into uh, the Kremlin uh, with his designated successor, uh, Dmitry Medvedev. And the talk was not uh, of, you know, sort of sovereign democracy. In fact, uh, Medvedev explicitly uh, said that he thought the idea of sovereign democracy was uh, uh, pretty much rubbish um, uh, during this period, something that Putin had never done, even though he'd never used the concept. Uh, and, you know, sort of, you've got uh, something of a, a supposed reset of relations between, in particular, Russia and the United States under the Obama administration. So these populist themes um, sort of didn't uh, emerge. These constraints, both leadership constraints, uh, are, are having uh, Putin as the articulator of populist themes uh, and um, uh, 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 sort of the transformation of these ideas into something greater were removed uh, uh, in the 2011-2012 electoral cycle. And this allowed for the development of populism in Russia. So what we get is the development of a form of populism in power, right? So my definition of populism here is, you know, sort of rooted uh, in a basic uh, Laclauian definition of populism, okay? Um, I'm afraid uh, um, uh, I'm an Essex boy at heart, um, you know, sort of, um, I, I wasn't a student uh, of Ernesto Laclaus. Well, I was very briefly a student of Ernesto, Ernesto Laclaus when I was an MA student, but um, uh, certainly, you know, sort of my way of thinking about politics was heavily influenced by um, the sort of Essex school of, of discourse analysis and its approach to populism. Uh, and so, you know, sort of populism is something think where by demands uh, are bound together by floating signifiers to facilitate their mobilization. Uh, and this, you know, sort of is uh, fundamentally a rhetorical performative act uh, that can be represented by a, a leader and perhaps is, you know, sort of structurally prone uh, to selecting somebody out as the articulator of, uh, of these themes. Uh, but, you know, sort of, uh, obviously this needs to be changed in some way because Leclerc was principally talking about movements and, you know, sort of uh, whether you sort of look at his definitions and discussions of populism in um, um, uh, what's it called, Marxist ideology and uh, um, uh, and uh, 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 politics and ideology and Marxist uh, uh, thought, or uh, you know, sort of his more uh, mature work on populist uh, reason. Um, you know, sort of uh, principally, what he's talking about is you know, sort of movement style politics, and you know, sort of uh, this is obviously very different uh, because populism is something that is picked up and is used um, from um, you know, sort of within the political system in all order to, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, redirect uh, and create uh, a uh, new legitimation strategy for a political regime uh, that is already in power, to bind it together, to transform how political agency can be conceived, to create uh, new dimensions of legitimate and illegitimate political agency. Uh, and uh, this, you know, sort of uh, for me uh, and for um, uh, Sarah Mill, who I wrote uh, an article on this, um, is, you know, sort of uh, rooted in uh, uh, a new official me means uh, uh, form of thinking about the relationship between state and society um, uh, and who are in groups, who are out groups, both domestically and internationally. Uh, and, you know, sort of when you get this, um, you know, sort of um, uh, state building project coming out from a regime uh, that is based around ideas about what the true nation of the people is, that is used to create new uh, forms of, of in and out group uh, and to set new standards for what uh, state building is, then you have a form of 
of official populism, uh, a populism that is not movement centered, although might try to give rise to movements as, you know, sort of uh, the Putin regime has done variously uh, at different points um, uh, since uh, 2012, uh, but, you know, sort of uh, is, you know, sort of um, um, uh, 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 fundamentally uh, sort of rewriting the rules of, of populism through, uh, through of politics through discursive strategies, right? So uh, it is more than just a legitimation strategy. All politicians uh, to some extent or other uh, use you know, things which uh, have a populist dimension to them because all politicians make claims about the people. Right, you know, sort of, it's a fundamental staple of politics. Um, uh, but you know, sort of, you need something more than that. So when Sarah and I were sort of thinking about this, and uh, when we were involved in a series of uh, workshops, shops thinking about sort of populism as a response to you know sort of changes uh, in, uh, in 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 global politics. Uh, you know, sort of for us, the only way that you could talk about populism um, uh, coming from within power rather than challenging power uh, in this way was to think about this in terms of, you know, sort of uh, uh, how it uh, changed the balance and conceptualization of, of state and society and state society relations. So uh, this, you know, sort of um, means that, you know, sort of earlier claims about populism in Russia don't really fit right so when you know people were talking about the sort of putin as populist in the 2000s uh they were <coughs> sorry they were frequently confusing putin's popularity uh with populism and frequently um you know sort of misidentifying the thinness of putin's ideology uh with uh, uh populism because of the idea that you know sort of populism is ideologically thin um uh this you know sort of was not necessarily the case you know sort of putinism um you know sort of was not articulated at all as an ideology uh it was you know sort of a uh, 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 a means of governing a regime uh, and it was also therefore um, ideologically uh, pluralist uh, in uh, this period of time um, uh, rather than thin. Uh, it was merely political pragmatism rather than any ideological position at all uh, and you know sort of Putin's popularity was based on uh, the ability of people to read into Putinism uh, and Putin himself as a political actor, uh, whatever it was they wanted. Uh, and this was, you know, something that we could see uh, in all sorts of uh, different sort of sociological studies of Russian public opinion during this period of time. You know, why do you like him? I like him because he's an economic liberal. I like him because he's a nationalist. I like him because he's strong. Uh, you know, so simply I like him because he doesn't drink as much as Yeltsin did, you know, sort of there were multiple reasons for for liking um, uh, uh, Putin uh, and you know sort of there was no way that you know sort of the various populist uh, possible signifiers that existed in Russian politics like Russia as a great power like the idea of sovereign democracy um, uh, bound together uh, different sorts of demands uh, about uh, the Russian political system from people who might have, you know, sort of felt marginalized to create something that was a populist project uh, for the reconstruction of the, the state. So, you know, sort of populism comes late and it comes through particular channels. Uh, and yes, you know, some of the ideas that were knocking around, uh, some of the things that Putin said earlier in his reign, all the way back to when he first comes to power in 2000, uh, you know, sort of later emerge as part of the official populism of Russia. Uh, but, you know, sort of there, it, that, that's, you know, sort of uh, doesn't mean that Russia was populist until this late period. And this, you know, sort of marks a sea change in Russian politics around 2011, 2012. Um, uh, and, you know, sort of frequently what people are talking about before that is, you know, sort of misplaced unity uh, and the construction 
construction uh, of uh, mechanical administrative uh, um, uh, institutions, procedures uh, to um, sort of govern rather than a populist project. United Russia, the project parties uh, that emerged uh, in the sort of 2000s uh, to facilitate the management uh, of the um, of the uh, uh, of the Russian political system. Uh, these were not, you know, sort of signs of populism. They were, you know, sort of uh, uh, just sort of uh, seeking out efficient electoral management in order that there weren't threats. Sorry, I'm going to stop for a minute and close my window uh, because um, uh, they decided to start building next door. Yes. Uh, so there are all sorts of diggers there. Uh, when I started, I don't know where they've gone, they've disappeared for lunch or something, but they've started up again. Uh, and even though it's very hot here, um, it's, it's beginning to disturb me. Sorry about that. So there were, you know, sort of grounds established, if you like, uh, through some of the things that happened in the 2000s for the establishment of populism, but this was not, uh, you know, sort of populism. So populism comes about, uh, as I say, you know, sort of after 2011. And uh, why does it come about? Uh, well, there are a variety of reasons. The first is the economic crisis and the failure of the modernization agenda um, in 2008 to 2011. So the economic, uh, the international financial crisis hits Russia and hits it very, very hard uh, in 2008. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, sort of uh, uh, unexpectedly, as far as the Russian government is concerned, if you go back and look at what Putin Medvedev was saying about the international financial crisis is beginning to unfold in, uh, in, 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 in 2008, 2009, um, you know, sort of, uh, they were uh, very, very confident that it wasn't going to affect them. Uh, and uh, in fact, they were preaching uh, to the Western world that you should be more like us uh, uh, rather than us be more like you if you want to avoid crisis. They were then uh, hit with the deepest uh, of all uh, developed countries' economic recessions um, uh, as a reward uh, for their sort of hubris uh, in 2009. Uh, and um, uh, they really uh, had... Um, uh, uh, no way of thinking themselves out of this. Uh, what they talked about were the same things uh, that they'd been talking about economically before the crisis hit uh, in uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, and uh, they began to sort of uh, actually um, stimulate people's discontent with the political system. Uh, because they were effectively saying uh, the political system is unable to conduct the forms of modernization that we said are necessary, and we will be stuck in uh, economic crisis, uh, on vulnerable to economic crisis for eternity until, unless and until uh, we reform the political system uh, and its ability to promote economic growth based on the modernization of industry and the diversification away from fossil fuel dependency. So, um, you know, sort of they, 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 they were in crisis economically, but even when they began to come out of economic crisis, not because particularly of anything that the government did, but because of the recovery of energy prices globally, uh, which, you know, sort of pumped a vast amount of money back into the Russian economy, uh, they uh, maintain themselves intellectually on a crisis footing. So something had to change. And in particular, things had to change because there was the prospective development of an alternative populist movement based around uh, Alexei Navalny uh, and the sort of liberal anti-corruption and liberal nationalism uh, that Navalny stood for. Um, uh, this has been very well uh, described by um, a Finnish political scientist called Lassila, um, who's, you know, sort of uh, analysed sort of, you know, Navalny and the sort of uh, the rhetoric that he, um, you know, sort of uh, put forward, uh, which was very much anti-elitist, you know, sort of calling United Russia, Putin's party, it's the party uh, of um, uh, um, um, thieves and swindlers and swindlers and thieves. That's one of the things that that banner in the background there says, uh, down with the party of thieves and swindlers. Um, and, you know, sort of uh, this, you know, sort of, um, you know, kind of um, movement was, you know, sort of plugged in at different levels and beginning to sort of bind together 
disparate anti-elitist um, uh, forces. Now, it was not, you know, sort of um, a, a, a complete and utter challenge um, to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the regime, um, even though Navalny, when he was allowed to run for the mayor of Moscow, um, you know, sort of did uh, very well in uh, the face of, you know, sort of official hostility uh, and electoral corruption and got, uh, what was it, 34% of the vote. Um, but, you know, sort of, uh, it looked to have some mobilizing potential, uh, particularly when people came out on the streets to demonstrate the 2011 elections to parliament in December uh, and uh, to uh, began to sort of look forward to demonstrating over uh, the uh, 2012 presidential elections. Uh, and, you know, sort of analysis of what was going on in the crowds at those demonstrations uh, by sort of Russian sociologists, a uh, uh, paper by a man called Matt Vieth, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, found that you know there was this uh, populist um, uh, uh, elements to the demonstrations in that people were coming together um, making claims about you know sort of representing the people against electoral fraud uh, based on existing constitutional processes uh, and principles uh, and you know sort of this you know sort of was a potential moment of mass mobilization uh, against uh, the regime and there were indeed demonstrations across Russia at this point in time and it was you know sort of the biggest threat. So official populism was a reaction to this, to the fact that, you know, sort of discourses about economic uh, modernization had uh, uh, run into a dead end and were actually counterproductive, uh, and, to the, and to the fact that there was this threat on the street uh, from uh, what looked like an alternative um, uh, anti-elite, anti-Putin, anti-regime uh, coalition uh, of people. And if you were to look at, you know, sort of the pictures of those demonstrations from 2011, early 2012, you'll see all sorts of, um, you know, disparate political groups coming together on a sort of common constitutional we are the people anti-elite uh, platform you'll see people holding up banners uh from the oil company yukos which was obviously um you know sort of uh, associated uh, with mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was imprisoned by uh putin in 2004 and yukos was taken over standing next to people with banners from the communist party or banners from uh some uh um, um uh, uh, nationalist grouping um a, a real mixture of people uh, uh, sort of being fused together by this rhetoric about the party of uh, swindlers and thieves. So Putin develops a uh, populist discourse of his own. He does this in the first place through a series of articles which are published um, uh, around, you know, sort of the beginning of 2012, uh, which give his thoughts on various different issues, on democracy, on the economy, on international relations, on Russia as a, a multi-ethnic state. Uh, and these articles, um, you know, sort of uh, lay out a set of principles uh, that, you know, sort of uh, Putin then uses over the next couple of years in a variety of sort of, you know, kind of big political issue speeches uh, that, you know, sort of frame uh, uh, what official populism is. Now, it's all based around this notion of Russia having a particular civilizational identity, right? That Russia is uh, not simply a people, uh, are not simply ethnic Russians, according to Putin. It is a civilization that has existed for, you know, most of the last thousand years, uh, it, during which the different peoples of Russia, the different ethnic groups, uh, with, you know, sort of ethnic Russians being the largest of those ethnic groups, have, you know, sort of learned to live together <coughs> in a particular way to create a distinct identity. And this identity is religious and morally conservative. Now, the key part of this is the morally conservative part. Religion creates morally conservative ideas for Putin, uh, but all religions do this. So Russian orthodoxy is 
more important than some of the other religions, but only, you know, sort of uh, in numerical terms, not in uh, um, ideological, ideational terms. So this is not uh, the sort of, you know, kind of Russian nationalism that you might have associated uh, with mid 19th century czarism. Then the watchword was autocracy, orthodoxy, nationality, uh, and, you know, sort of autocratic leadership uh, was, you know, sort of uh, there to promote a single notion of Russian nationality based around orthodox Christianity. Doesn't matter, uh, Putin said, if you're a, uh, a Buddhist, um, a, uh, a, a, a Jew, uh, a Muslim, obviously Russia has a very large uh, Muslim population, all of these religious, um, you know, sort of identities, all of these different confessional practices uh, have existed with each other over the course of a thousand years or so uh, in Russia and have learned to get along with one another as the basis of civilization uh, because of their shared moral concerns. They are all concerned with, you know, sort of traditional family structures, uh, traditional um, uh, gender uh, 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 identities. Uh, all of these things um, unite the Russian people across uh, different, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 social, ethnic, uh, language, uh, uh, religious uh, groups, uh, and this is the foundation of. Russian civilization. It's an organic identity that has been created uh, through, you know, sort of uh, long run historical processes. It is not an abstraction. It's a lived reality. It doesn't, you know, sort of find its expression in abstract intellectual values and concepts, right? You know, uh, what are abstract intellect, uh, values and concepts? They're things like multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is an idea created by intellectuals. Russian civilization is multicultural in that it has a large number of different cultures within it, but they are bound together by the moral conservatism that people have, uh, the moral conservatism that people want, uh, and the moral conservatism that people value uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. So it's not an abstraction, it's real multiculturalism rather than something founded uh, in uh, liberal notions of the equivalence of, of cultures, um, you know, and the tolerance of difference, uh, all of those things. Russians truly tolerate difference because they share something in common. They don't care about each other's differences, uh, supposedly, in fact, they, they, they very often do, uh, but they don't care about each other's differences. It doesn't matter to a Russian if you're Orthodox or, you know, sort of uh, uh, Buddhist, if you're Muslim, uh, uh, if you're a worker or, or, uh, or, or a, 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 a a sheep herder, uh, a reindeer herder, uh, an animist, uh, because you share common values. So orthodoxy is dominant in this civilizational identity, uh, but it, there is no conflict based on this dominant. Uh, the people are Rossiski, right? So Russian with an O, uh, rather than Ruski, Russian with a U. You may be Ruski, that is to say, uh, you may be somebody whose uh, sole first language uh, is Russian, uh, who is white, uh, who is possibly uh, uh, high cheekboned, blonde and blue eyed, uh, but you know, sort of uh, your Russian ethnicity uh, as it's expressed through language looks um, you know, sort of uh, uh, religion, etc. Um, you know, sort of make you part of a common Russian whole, uh, uh, the people of the Rossiskaya Federatsia, the Russian Federation with an O, if you like. Now, this collective identity, Rush, uh, Putin argued, is expressed in support for the state and the function of the state is to protect this. So, you know, sort of the Russian state works, Putin argued, because it reflects this unity of cultural values that people have.
Uh, and it draws on the strength of those cultural values uh, uh, and you know sort of people support it because it protects those cultural values so there is this symbiotic state society relationship uh, this harmony that exists between state and people uh, which is the source of political stability and political strength uh, of Russia <coughs> sorry still got a bit of a cough I finally succumbed to COVID and uh, and my my throat's not completely recovered but anyway this you know sort of is the basis of you know sort of what the russian state is uh, and the basis of 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 how uh, you sort of uh, can be a legitimate political actor in russia for putin so putin argued uh, that russia uh, is not unique in the world uh, but unique certainly uh, in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe in that it has retained uh, its civilizational identity uh, and other states have not. So there's a quote there uh, from a speech that Putin made in, 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 in 2013, uh, where he said, you know, sort of uh, other nations are revising their moral values and ethnic norms, ethical norms, eroding traditions and differences between peoples and cultures. So Russia respects difference because there is unity through difference in Russia other people are eroding those differences uh, uh, because you know sort of you have to recognize everyone's right to freedom of conscious political views privacy accept the equality of good and evil uh, uh, even though they are really opposites in meaning and this destroys traditional values negatively for society and it's essentially anti-democratic it's anti-democratic because it's based on abstract speculative ideas contrary to the will of the majority, right? The majority of people across the world and certainly across Europe, Putin argued, you know, sort of share the sorts of traditional values that Russians uh, value and that are at the heart of Russian political life uh, and the functionality of the Russian state and its strength. Uh, that's being eroded elsewhere. So Russia is actually more democratic than anywhere else. Um, it has a state which reflects the will of the majority and the will of the majority is the preservation, cultivation, uh, uh, and expansion of uh, traditional values. Um, you know, sort of unlike this Ukrainian who is uh, looking uh, to make a choice between uh, the devil, um, uh, homosexuality, uh, drugs, uh, and the European Union, uh, you know, sort of Russians are looking towards tradition, uh, the church, um, uh, the traditional defense of the motherland, the three Bogatir, uh, uh, the, the Russian warriors uh, protecting the steppe, and family. Uh, and God, right, you know, sort of, uh, and uh, it has not divided people up sectionally through political parties. Um, the state uh, and uh, its leader are above uh, these things. So this, you know, sort of uh, has to be protected. And Putin argued, uh, this is now a period of great danger um, uh, in the life of, uh, uh, of Russia as a state civilization. Globalization, cultural homogenization, um, you know, sort of uh, are all threatening uh, from outside the values of the state, right? This picture sort of sums it up. Uh, obviously, you know, sort of, we have Starbucks here uh, at the bottom, uh, you know, sort of uh, the global symbol for um, uh, cultural homogenization. Uh, and at the back, uh, uh, we have Marshal Zhukov, um, uh, you know, sort of the great military hero of World War II, uh, a protector uh, of Russia from uh, the uh, annihilatory practices of, of Nazis. So, you know, sort of globalization, cultural homogenization, push a single set of, um, you know, sort of abstract ideas about multiculturalism uh, uh, and liberalism. But equally bad are revolutionary ideas uh, and ethno-nationalist ideas which seek to promote one ethnicity above uh, anybody else and seek to foster um, uh, the um, 
uh, uh, ethnic separation uh, of people who have been united in a civilization for uh, centuries. So Putin was arguing sort of 2012 uh, and onwards uh, that, you know, sort of the state is needed to protect the cultural code uh, of Russia. Sometimes he calls it a genetic and cultural code, um, uh, as though you know, the cultural code is, is actually sort of in some way kind of biologically internalized by all of the peoples of Russia um, uh, to uh, uh, act, to you know, work against all of these things which are coming from outside and which are promoted by a global elite. Now this redefined political agency, right? It's anti-pluralist and it established um, as a, a a political equivalence between all of the people that Putin sort of described as enemies, liberals, intellectuals, Marxists, uh, and uh, ethno-nationalists, right? Uh, this is a picture uh, of a, pl a, um, a placard that was, placard, a placade, uh, that was put on uh, the front of uh, Dom Knigi, uh, the House of Books. The House of Books is the biggest, um, bookshop in Moscow still, I think it's massive. Uh, it's on one of the main shopping precincts in, in Moscow. And if you were to go that way from the House of Books, uh, it, I don't know, about a kilometre maybe to, uh, to, to the Kremlin. So uh, this is a prominent uh, street. And uh, obviously what we have here are the literal aliens, right? These are the aliens dressed up in suits, uh, from uh, the the classic movie Alien, um, Aliens, Alien Genesis. God knows how many of them there've been. Uh, and the text underneath says, you know, uh, fifth column, Piatia Colonna, Chujiesh Thirdinas. Aliens are amongst us, right? And the aliens are people who supported uh, this white ribbon movement, wearing the white ribbon in the demonstrations in 2011, 2012, uh, was a sign that you were for a Russia without Putin. Right. So, you know, sort of and the aliens, there are, are a variety of cultural and political figures you might uh, particularly recognize. Um, um, uh, Alexei Navalny uh, there, um, uh, and also in the middle, uh, Boris Nemtsov, um, who was not long after this placard was up, about a year later, um, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, shot. So Putin, through this articulation of this view of civilizational identity, uh, sort of was uh, re-articulating political agency and creating um, false equivalences effectively between uh, all sorts of different political actors uh, to deny uh, their agency uh, and to deny them, you know, sort of a, a, a place within uh, political discussion within Russia. So we have this process, you know, we're all familiar with, of, of, of othering, of, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, um, uh, using uh, certain uh, tropes um, to, you know, sort of uh, create equivalences uh, that, you know, sort of can cast certain people out. Aliens, uh, foreign agents, this is the time of the introduction of the, of the strengthened law about, you know, classifying people as foreign agents, um, you know, sort of servants of the West, uh, people who articulate values which are not in line with the values of people, right? So all of this, you know, sort of um, uh, creates a, a, a very hostile environment. State and leader are placed above other institutions the state not as a set of institutions uh, through which people work and through which different interests you know, struggle, but the state as a sort of in itself abstract concept, uh, a, a protector of, of Russian values and embodied in the leader, uh, in Putin. Uh, you know, we begin to get the, the notion of the indispensable Putin. Without Putin, there is no Russia. Right, you know, sort of that kind of idea. Uh, other interests, uh, other organizations, other groups represent sexual interests, not the national whole. 
Um, so, you know, sort of Putin is above uh, all other things. Uh, uh, these traditional values can no longer replicate themselves on their own. They need to be protected actively by the state. So there is an agenda for cultural preservation, uh, for uh, cultural transformation. Uh, and this is part of the state's mission. The state is not there um, in this view uh, to provide uh, material satisfaction, right? Uh, this is not about the incorporation of people who feel excluded into the system through the development of administrative politics, uh, which will, you know, sort of satisfy people's welfare needs um, through the development of welfare policy and welfare institutions, um, uh, through, you know, sort of development of, of agencies of taxation and economic redistribution. It is there to protect your general values. Now this is both a very, uh, you know, sort of um, um, uh, 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 rigid in terms of how it excludes people and very loose in terms of what uh, goals it sets for the state to achieve. The state does, um, you know, sort of whatever uh, and is successful effectively when Putin says it's successful uh, at, uh, at um, um, uh, uh, promoting traditional values, right? So it opens up a political space. This, this populist discourse is a regime supporting discourse, um, you know, sort of, I've, 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 I've labeled it, you know, sort of, uh, it allows people to come with traditional ideas and uh, bring them into the sort of political space uh, uh, to have them service the regime and uh, deem and exclude people. So in 2013, uh, 2012, 2013, uh, that was the sort of trial of Pussy Riot. It was the uh, uh, increasing action taken to um, um, uh, stigmatize uh, homosexuality and alternative lifestyles. Um, you know, sort of it was uh, a bit later, um, the revisions to laws on domestic violence, for example, making certain forms of domestic violence um, uh, uh, a non-criminal offence, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 because uh, they took place within the, the boundaries of a traditional relationship. Uh, it came out externally in sort of uh, propaganda and support for populists uh, and increased accusations uh, against uh, 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 foreign critics of the regime as being Russophobic, right? You weren't simply criticizing the regime anymore, you were criticizing the Russian people because regime, state, leader were bound together uh, in this civilizational whole, uh, feeding and supporting one another and strengthening one another in ways that criticism denied and therefore criticism was not merely anti-Putinism, it was Russophobic, it was a pathological dislike of Russia, a refusal to accept Russians for who they really are. Right. Um, so, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, this is the, the view. Now, what effect does it have? Uh, well, um, uh, it has a limited effect, uh, to be honest. Uh, what it promotes is not mobilization, but apathy. Right. If nothing except this official vision is legitimate uh, and you don't really see yourself in this traditional vision, particularly, you just sort of are estranged from politics, right? Your um, 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 your uh, 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 removed from the political system, uh, 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 and you know, sort of. Uh, so Putin's popularity doesn't go up particularly, uh, but you know, sort of, uh, people are not engaged by opposition either. So the system sort of finds a kind of balance. The thing that changes that is 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. Uh, people like that. Uh, they like it because, you know, sort of it's Russia being active in the world. They like it because, you know, sort of um, uh, it's reclaiming a part of, uh, of Ukraine that they see as being Russian. They, it's re reclaiming a part of Ukraine to which a lot of Russians, particularly older Russians, have a great deal of sentimental 
attachment, you know, sort of Crimea was the, um, uh, the Soviet um, sort of play area, the utopia uh, that you went to as a child, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, a place that you might have uh, very fond memories of, uh, you know, sort of your holiday destination. Uh, 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 but, you know, sort of uh, that doesn't, you know, sort of last because, you know, sort of this is not an activist economic agenda uh, and therefore the economy continues to be stagnant. It doesn't go into recession, but it doesn't grow either. Uh, so you've got this tension uh, between sort of apathy, economic dissatisfaction, and some stimulated uh, sort of national pride. Uh, but, you know, sort of the discourse itself does not particularly cut through, except insofar as it creates apathy. Now, how does this help lead to war? Um, well, uh, it does uh, so because of how it you know, sort of feeds into Russian foreign policy discourse and the way in which it frames what Ukraine is as an existential threat. Right. So if Russia is a civilization and a state civilization, then one of the things that is to be done by the state is to act in international relations in a way that protects that state civilization. And that state civilization is not bound by the borders of Russia as a territorial state. Right. Now, there's, uh, this is a long quote, essentially. It's um, uh, from uh, an article by a man called Boris Mejuyev, um, who is a professor of philosophy at Moscow State University. Uh, it's uh, from a journal which is online called Russia and Global Affairs uh, from 2018. Uh, and it, it summarizes what the sort of populist civilizational identity argument um, says about Russia and its place in the world, right? Um, uh, the world is divided into separate civilizational blocks made up of the core and the periphery. So Russia is at the core of one of these civilizational blo blocks. Others might be in Europe, they might be uh, in, uh, in China, uh, they might be uh, in the Americas, they might be in Turkey, India, you know, sort of, but this is the core of the civilizational block in Russia, right? And peripheral states include regions which gravitate to, towards different civilizational centers. So a core civilizational state like Russia, you know, has states which orientate towards it. Right. So Russia has its own orbit of attraction. The next point says this was six, six points, seven points at the end of this paper, synopsizing things uh, very neatly. It's his own civilization, its own orbit of attraction, and it can claim leadership in Eastern and Central Europe. Right. You may think that you have your own interests. You may even think you have your own civilization. You are deluded. Uh, you are part of a greater Russian civilization space, the greater Russian world, uh, as it's sometimes called, uh, and, you know, sort of um, uh, this, you know, sort of is a permanent leadership position that Russia occupies. The claim to leadership is permanent for Russia, right, uh, but uh, dangerous for the status quo situation in Europe. Russia has this leadership role, Russia will always have this leadership role. If other people doubt that and try and attract states which are in Russia's sphere of influence and, att and attraction, then, you know, that threatens Russian leadership and the status quo is therefore, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, dangerous. Russia is not a threat in this as long as you don't annoy it further by encroaching uh, on its traditional sphere of uh, attraction, right? This can be resolved, this danger can be ameliorated if Euro-Atlantic civilizational leaders uh, create a demilitarized buffer zone up to, uh, made up of limit, limit troph uh, Eastern European states. In other words, states that are around the periphery of the Russian civilizational area and the Euro-Atlantic civilizational area uh, that are attracted either to Russia or Europe um, uh, should, you know, sort of be a buffer zone between the two, right? Um, uh, not part of one zone or another. Rejection of such an agreement will inevitably lead to the further fragmentation of, 
fragmentation of Ukraine and Moldova and a possible repetition of the Ukrainian scenario by which he means uh, the division uh, of Ukraine that followed uh, the revolution of dignity in 2014, the Euromaidan, uh, when you have the emergence of the Donetsk and the Luhansk People's Republics uh, and the uh, 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 annexation of Crimea uh, in other states, enabling Russia would have a influential Russian centric minority. So don't mess about in Central Asia because Kazakhstan has a Russia-centric minority. Uh, uh, don't mess around any further in Ukraine uh, because that will cause future problems. Uh, and, you know, sort of prospectively under this sort of opinion, don't, you know, sort of think that the situation as it exists uh, in the Baltic states where there it may be a Russia-centric minority uh, is, you know, sort of uh, uh, over yet, even though they're members of NATO and the European Union. So any attempt to deprive Russia of this regional sphere of influence, um, you know, sort of paradoxically strengthens its claim to global leadership. Yeah, um, you know, sort of the more you push us back on this, the more keenly we become aware of our civilizational identity uh, and our civilizational status uh, and the way in which we are at the heart of this, the more keenly you make people in areas like um, uh, Transnistria, uh, in uh, Moldova or Luhansk and Donetsk, aware of the fact that, you know, sort of you are separating them from their civilizational uh, core and the more Russia's leadership becomes important to them and the more it has to confront the Euro-Atlantic bloc, right? So Russia needs to, effectively by this point, has, um, uh, you know, given up all efforts to become part of the Euro-Atlantic community and should start viewing it as an alien civilizational space. We are not Europeans, right? Um, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, if you want to get poetic about it and go back to uh, uh, Alec uh, Alexander Bloch, the Russian symbolist poet from the uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we're not Europeans, we're Scythians, we look on uh, Europe with uh, bloodshot eyes, um, you know, sort of, uh, it is alien to us, right, it is apart from us, um, you know, sort of, we are not European. You remember I talked uh, at the beginning about the balance that Putin had in sort of 2005, 2006, where he was talking about you know, sort of Russia as something that, you know, had developed tandem with Europe as part of Europe, that its traditions mir mirrored those of Europe. This is gone, right? Euro-Atlantic identity is alien to us. Uh, and, you know, sort of any attempt to sort of move into our area uh, is alien to us as well. Now, this, you know, sort of like the redefinition of political agency uh, and legitimacy in domestic politics is the redefinition of international agency and legitimacy. It justifies great power politics and it places civilizational states above all others. Uh, because their claim as core states, um, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, trumps uh, the claims of lesser states to having rights and to having sovereignty, right? It argues that uh, supranational bodies uh, like the European Union are illegitimate because they don't reflect traditional values, right? Uh, they represent alien values to Russia and to their populations as a whole. Um, you know, sort of, it's no surprise that, you know, sort of the Russians have pumped a lot of money uh, into West European, uh, um, East European politicians who are critical of the European Union uh, and who stand for similar types of traditional values uh, to those that the Russians uh, have expressed. So, you know, sort of, uh, these bodies are illegitimate. They don't represent themselves and they certainly are not bodies with which you know, sort of, we are prepared to sort of establish relationships towards. They are pushing alien agendas, alien agendas to the people who are within Russia's uh, civilizational sphere of influence and alien agendas to their own people. And Putin's Eurasian Union project, you know, sort of the economic project uh, that was supposed to include Ukraine and uh, 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 and uh, to which Ukraine's leadership before uh, the Euromaidan uh, had uh, pledged itself is an ideological project as well, if you like, a civilizational project, you 
better uh, rather than an economic uh, project uh, alone, uh, as it had originally been conceived by, you know, sort of um, people like um, uh, the Sultan Nazarbayev of, of Kazakhstan when he had first started talking about such a thing uh, in the 2000s. Now, Ukraine poses an existential threat to this, right? Uh, because, um, you know, sort of, first of all, um, you know, sort of Ukraine is insisting upon its sovereignty, but this theory says that the sovereignty of peripheral states uh, is less than the rights uh, and trumped by the rights of the civilizational core. Um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, their, um, you know, ability to protect that civilization depends upon um, their ability to project force and to have influence. And Ukraine's insistence, particularly after 2014, on, on its sovereignty uh, is a threat to Russia's ability to survive as a civilization, right? Ukraine is not a real state with full sovereign rights uh, in this view. Something that cl Putin clearly articulated on the eve of the invasion, right? Ukraine uh, is a, uh, a, a fictive state um, that, you know, sort of uh, as created uh, by, um, you know, sort of uh, and through the goodwill of Russia's rulers historically. So this map was put up on the uh, uh, on Russian TV shortly after Putin uh, made these statements, and it shows which bits of Ukraine were given to it by different Soviet leaders, so and at different times. So this yellow bit in the middle is Ukraine, right? This bit of sort of steppe land uh, that, you know, sort of, you know, kind of is divided by the uh, uh, Dnieper uh, River uh, and, you know, is where, you know, sort of there were some, you know, kind of Cossacks wandering around uh, in the 15th, 16th century. This orange bit was given to Ukraine as part of the sort of province of Ukraine by uh, Russian czars. This red bit uh, was given to Ukraine after World War II by Stalin. Uh, this bit here uh, was given to Ukraine after uh, uh, the incorporation and defeat of nationalist forces during the Russian uh, Civil War, um, uh, 1970 to 1921, uh, uh, by uh, Lenin. And this bit, the red bit, Crimea, was uh, given to Ukraine uh, in 1954 uh, by Khrushchev. Uh, to celebrate uh, the uh, union of this bit uh, of Ukraine with the Tsarist Empire back in uh, 1654, yeah, 300 years, uh, anniversary present. Um, so, you know, Ukraine doesn't exist. It is a toy of oligarchs uh, and it is being bombarded with, you know, sort of um, uh, false artificial alien cultural values, right? The West, liberalism, tolerance for alternative lifestyles, uh, and, uh, 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 and this, you know, sort of comes together uh, uh, to create a, you know, sort of existential threat uh, equivalent to that of the Nazis um, uh, in World War II to Russia uh, as this condominium of, of different peoples. So, you know, sort of the, the, the populist discourse creates this, you know, sort of world view, gives the state a particular time for functionality in international relations, and this, you know, sort of is in particular challenged by Ukraine in 2014 and consistently constantly thereafter, that Ukraine keeps its, its westward movement, that Ukraine replaces its leader peacefully um, uh, with the election of Zelensky um, uh, 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 and the defeat of Poroshenko, that Ukraine, you know, sort of uh, refuses uh, to make peace on Russia's terms, uh, that Ukraine, you know, sort of maintains, you know, sort of aspirations to European membership and to NATO membership variously over these years, but, you know, sort of they are there. Not significantly, in fact, during the first part of Poroshenko's reign, it's only later uh, that he moves back towards NATOism, uh, but they are there nonetheless. So this obviously is, you know, sort of the ideological, uh, ideological ideational background to war. 
Now, um, I think I've almost been talking for an hour, so I'll, you know, so I'll draw it to an end. I said I wasn't going to talk very much on this. You know, it creates problems, obviously, for the West. There are all sorts of practical problems uh, that come up on a daily basis. What do we do about our dependency or the dependency of some European countries uh, on Russian energy and the fact that, you know, sort of we're feeding the Russian war machine with, you know, sort of uh, close to... Um, uh, um, a billion dollars a day uh, in uh, energy payments um, uh, uh, and, and also uh, Ukraine because Ukraine's getting transit payments for some of that energy as well. You know, it creates problems with refugees, it creates issues about supply of armament, armaments and some people's fear of uh, uh, conflict uh, expanding beyond uh, Ukraine, uh, 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 you know, sort of, and Russia has played on that fear, obviously, with various threats uh, about, you know, sort of supply lines being legitimate targets for Russia if weapons are coming into the country that will be used against it. Um, it also poses practical problems over solidarity uh, in the European Union over things like sanctions. Uh, and, you know, sort of how far do, uh, uh, you know, maintaining solidarity of sanctions allow some states, in particular, obviously, we're talking about Hungary, uh, to um, uh, 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 deal with, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, to um, uh, leverage the support for sanctions for, you know, sort of their own populist anti-democratic practices. Um, but obviously the major problem that it causes is how do you deal with Russia as a long term threat. But if these ideas, you know, sort of uh, persist, then there is a permanent danger uh, to, you know, sort of both international organizations and to European countries uh, that are viewed as threatening Russia's civilizational identity that are alien to its civilizational identity, that contain uh, Russia-orientated uh, minorities. So the Baltic states, um, uh, 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 Kazakhstan, um, uh, Belarus potentially, uh, if uh, Belarus uh, you know, sort of tries to overthrow uh, its dictator once more. Um, and you know, sort of uh, uh, this is a hard security problem rather than a soft security problem for those countries, uh, but also you know, sort of uh, an existential uh, problem in the same way that ideologically uh, the Soviet Union was seen as a, an existential threat to Western liberal democracy uh, during uh, periods of the Cold War. So these are the things that, you know, sort of um, are, are as yet unanswered, you know, sort of, and are causing ructions. Obviously, the way that some German politicians and thinkers have approached these, thinking about Germany uh, and what it means for Germany, as opposed, say, to some other European leaders who've been gung-ho for uh, Ukraine and talked about this in terms of, you know, sort of democracy versus uh, autocracy, um, you know, sort of, uh, these are divisions that, you know, sort of, and problems that have to be worked through uh, by uh, um, uh, Europe and the West more generally. So uh, just to conclude, because um, um, uh, I'm sure you've uh, uh, had enough of, of talking, uh, me talking at you. There's a populist shift uh, that marks a turn uh, from a hybrid regime in Russia to an even less democratic form of po politics around 2012. Um, you know, sort of of, uh, and, and arguably, we might say that the development of populism within a hybrid regime is a marker uh, of declining hybridity generally, right? You know, sort of, uh, since it, it denotes, you know, sort of uh, a change from uh, uh, mixed strategies of state development and political management to particular strategies of state building and uh, 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 based on much more clearly defined exclusionary terms. This this is not tinkering with the electoral system. It's not persecuting one journalist while allowing others to go free. It is, you know, sort of placing things within a frame of state society uh, relations, uh, which are much uh, uh, more uh, clearly demarcated between insiders and outsiders, uh, and which establish terms for uh, electoral and political manipulation on far, um, you know, sort of uh, better established grounds. Um, 
can it work? Well, in a sense, yes, it does um, uh, work in that it, you know, sort of denies agency uh, to opposition forces and allows for their persecution more completely than before. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mobilize people behind it. You know, sort of this is not a sort of populist movement that mobilizes electorally and comes to power in the same way that you might sort of argue, say, Chavismo did uh, in, in Venezuela. Um, it is equally potentially anti-pluralist as that, but it is coming from within power uh, and it may well breed apathy. And it has to overcome the fact that it is building on top of previous legitimation strategies. And those previous strategies may well, as they were in Russia, have been eudaimonic. They may have been concerned with people's welfare and increasing wealth. Uh, and people might still look to that old standard of judging the government and its success and legitimacy rather than the new one. And in that case, you have a problem um, uh, uh, that, you know, sort of, uh, how do you sort of keep this going? Arguably, you know, sort of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine might be uh, uh, an answer to that. You step up the international hostility and pressure and conflict um, uh, in order to sort of force people uh, towards, uh, you know, sort of your position uh, and your uh, and to identify uh, with the sort of uh, populist uh, uh, rhetoric about uh, civilization and what binds Russia together uh, more clearly than they did before. But there are dangers within this in and of themselves, you know, sort of, uh, can you uh, domesticate the differences that still exist within society that you might link together through your articulatory practices? Or might you stimulate people to seek more for the particular interest that they have, to seek more rights uh, for, um, uh, you know, sort of your people as an Islamic people in, say, Chechnya, um, uh, and, you know, sort of uh, uh, to back up local ruler, or uh, for Russian nationalists to make more demands about, uh, about, about their special status. One of the things you can see, for example, in some of the military um, uh, uh, press criticism of what the war in Ukraine is that it is not Russian enough, right? It is not, you know, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of based firmly enough on pushing Russian ethnic superiority. Um, so, you know, sort of, you create spaces uh, for people to criticize uh, the discourse uh, by extenuating certain elements of it. And that might lead to longer term management problems for this discourse and for the regime as a whole. Right, I'll stop there. Um, uh, um, and, uh, um, I believe uh, you're now going to go on.